For a period of time, I was running an e-com business with a CEO's office that was probably larger in square footage than Jeff Bezos is. You know, there's got to be function. Yeah. But you've got to have a little bit of fun. Is the next 20 years of online shopping going to be exactly the same way as it is now, kind of underpinned by this mishmash of data, or, or is there another way? Yeah. And, and that was what we that was what we started with R3. I mean, obviously, spoiler alert, like we can do that. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for driving down. How was the drive? Uh, it's a change. Normally working in the centre of London, um, I'm pretty much on the train every single day. Um, and so to be sitting in my car, listening to uh, podcasts and having a signal, there's uh, quite a change. Well, I quite enjoy it, though. Uh, yeah, I, I'm used to kind of multitasking. I like to read a book, yeah. check my emails, and either listen to music or podcast all at the kind of same time, which, uh, which you can it. only really yeah. do. You know, I think probably adding driving into the mix there is probably a step too far for multitasking. See, I used to work in London for like three, four months. I'm like an intern. I hated it. My last day was the um, Westminster attack. Okay. That threw me off. I didn't want to go back. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that puts you off. I was actually at an event uh, in London probably the day after that, and it certainly was a bit quiet, but um, you know, Londoners are generally used to getting back on the trains and getting back into yeah. work. And I guess after the last couple of years of like building businesses remotely and most people working from home, you know, I've always been quite keen to kind of get back into the office. And even if it's not just me in the office, like with my team, it's that whole kind of ecosystem around you, like yeah. the networking, the chance to go and meet people in the same sort of industry or similar. Um, so, yeah, I, I always try and go in as much as I can. I, mean, so I, I love being in the office environment. Like um, you said networking. Then I remember in COVID, the Zoom networking. Did you ever do any of that? Um, a little bit bit I felt like I got really spoiled uh, in terms of my office during COVID because uh, we founded the business like two weeks before COVID started and actually went into a co-working space for oh, okay. at least the first kind of nine months to a year of the company well of course like where's the one place that isn't going to be busy in an office yeah. it's going to be the co-working space where you're sharing desks and you know like why course, would you be yeah, there? Yeah. So I, I spent like my first time with, like running R three in an office that probably would have fit about two hundred people. Nice. So I always got the booth. Yeah. I yeah. always had like a window seat if I wanted to take my calls overlooking the Rosewood Hotel. It was fantastic, and I always had a chair to like hang my jacket on. <laughs> you had to be in touch, really, didn't it, you? Yeah. It was. Uh, I think for a period of time I was running an e-com business with an, a CEO's office that was probably larger in square footage than Jeff Bezos is. I mean, <laughs> so I would have stayed there for a while. I guess as soon as COVID stops, everyone starts coming back. You're like, why are you in my office for? Exactly. You're yes. so used to it. Yeah, it felt really, uh, yeah, re re felt really perturbed by the fact that there were now lots of people all <laughs> turning up into my space. Really precious about it. But like, oh, that's my, <laughs> yeah. my coat's chair. Yeah, that's uh, my private toilet. Yeah. <laughs> That booth, that's uh, that's my meeting room. What are you doing in there? But um, so before we go into aisle three and everything, we've got a lot of to talk about about that. So your background, obviously, has been e-commerce quite a lot of it. Obviously, you've got Amazon, Tesco's, and everything like that. So do you want to talk a bit about your background? Yeah, I'm certainly going to age myself now. Um, so uh, I've been in e-com for just over 15 years. I started that um, back at Amazon when there was about six of us in the marketplace team. So that's the... Uh, that's the part of the business where other companies and now individual sellers all go onto Amazon and sell their products. Um, and so many of the categories that exist now just simply didn't exist back yep. in that day. And so my journey kind of started there with probably about 200 people in the UK business. We used to be able to like walk to the fraud team and there was like four of them in an annex in the oh, fifth hey. floor of Slough. Like it completely unrecognizable. Exactly, nice. yeah, <laughs> completely unrecognizable to uh, to the business today. Um, and one of the things that always like I, I was really drawn to Amazon early on was this idea of creating like this single detail page, this place that like this everything store where you would come, mm -hmm. you shop, you could find anything and then you'd also be able to pick and choose whether you wanted to I don't, buy from Amazon directly or buy from another retailer that you knew or buy second hand and be yep. a bit more sustainable so it was amazing to be like in really in the weeds with all of the products that were spinning up around that marketplace for a period of I suppose nearly seven years I was there yeah 
It was fascinating. Um, again, I'm going to age myself now. This was before Prime existed. Right, okay. Right? So for I can't anyone actually remember that. Yeah, anyone <laughs> listening thinking, like, I've got Prime membership and I get my, my videos and I can also, like, listen to Amazon Music on my Alexa. No. We had five pounds free Super Saver delivery, which is absolutely nuts. Does it live, like, when you look back and do a time to Amazon to look where they are now is it ever just a bit of a bit of encouragement I guess motivation for you of what you're growing now um I think Amazon found lightning in a bottle at almost exactly the right time yeah I think when I look back at Amazon now and when I look at it now and then think like where's the motivation come from Amazon like many other businesses was on its knees at one point yeah um, during the uh, like the econ bubble, you know the share price was like next to nothing, and mm-hmm. you know Jeff Bezos and the team would have been beaten up by investors. So I think that's the kind of inspiration I take, rather than like just this idea of like scale and can yeah, you yeah. like can you capture this audience in this way in this shopper audience? I think actually for me that's the journey. Like the stuff before that, by the way, I don't think it's that sexy. I think there's a whole bunch of stuff yeah. that you know. At, Jeff Bezos, like a lot of entrepreneurs, are probably painted as being um, these guys that took like massive risks and oh, it's amazing they built it from a garage. But they came from pretty privileged backgrounds. Yeah, most of the founders in these businesses. Um, so it's that kind of bit from like the business going through a really difficult time and then coming out of it so strong. Mm. Remember, like eBay used to be that the, the uh, like the dominant marketplace. Yeah, and so we would actually be sitting there at times thinking about how we could get better than ebay you wouldn't think that now would you like how do you even like how do you comprehend that now because ebay going into the whole fast fashion not fast fashion but they're trying to rival it a bit aren't they um you've got to think even like the love island endorsement deals a lot of them the ebay second hand yeah they're certainly doing a good job at the moment in the sneaker industry where they've built um like an authentication (laughs) service um so like building an authentication service Mm -hmm. is is probably a smart way yeah rivaling that as well but you've got to think they've have to adapt a little bit now because why, why would you go on eBay? Yeah. I haven't been on it in years. No, it's a huge business though. Yeah, massive. And there's loads of these businesses that are huge. I mean, think about um, something like Pinterest, right? Almost everyone on the, like, you know, everyone in the country, most people on the planet have heard of businesses like Reddit and Pinterest and Twitter, right? Like, who's, who's Twitter? Like, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I hate Twitter. <laughs> is it? Oh, I can't stand it. The only thing I go on Twitter for is um, transfer rumours for football. Okay. And even then, it's only Reddit ones because they're not everywhere else. They're not on Sky and everything like that. Right, okay. But it is pretty irrelevant. I don't really know why Elon Musk went and bought that out of everything, but he must know something. Uh, yeah, I think... Um Again, going back to entrepreneurs, when you've got that much kind of net worth that isn't real money, by the way, it's imaginary shares in a company that no one can ever afford to buy. Like when a business is literally as big as like the GDP of many countries, no one's ever going to buy the shares. So how Mm -hmm. do you actually realize that value? Yeah. To realize that value, you have to spend those shares. You have to buy something. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's very possible to kind of leverage that. So it's an interesting one. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, bizarre. <laughs> but yeah, like so, some distance away from yeah, talking about thinking how Amazon grew. But I mean, again, there, there's just so much oppor- like there's so much opportunity. Twenty years ago, there was a lot of opportunity, a lot of disruption. Uh, again, like you know, like I suppose in my industry, thinking specifically e-commerce and yeah. shopping, you know, there is stuff that twenty years ago was kind of a given, like these kind of big archaic lumbering price comparison sites that existed and these directories where you'd go and find like where to buy the best TV and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, you know, not really much has changed in in some ways in that particular industry. And now that we're kind of at this really pivotal moment where we've got like this apex of technology, like diverging with kind of costs and then like consumer demand that you know, I think it's going to be a really interesting time for the next few years. And, you know, does someone come and rival the likes of Amazon and these other businesses, which, um, you know, the Earth's most customer-centric company, like, that, that's that's bullshit. Like, yeah, straight yeah. away, that, that's just, like, not like that anymore. Um, and let's be honest, like, even Google literally dropped their slogan, which they always promised they had. Their motto was, don't be evil. And mm. they quietly shuffled that off the like out of the way like they went out the door 
So there's going to be a big shift now, I think, um, over the next few years because of how people react to some of these really big corporations. Mm. And I think it's quite interesting because you said about the technology and stuff and IO3 where obviously you founded and that's where you're working now and everything. I've never seen anything like that personally for that industry, which is what I find always really interesting. Like I keep going on there and having a look and everything like that. My issue is I buy my all my clothes and shoes from the exact same company and I get discount when I go on there and it's stuff. I'm in such a habit of it, I never look well, elsewhere. Yeah, so if you start buying your sneakers, trainers from R three, then you get you get three percent cash back on every purchase. So maybe that's a way to uh, come back and uh, shop again. But yeah, like to just put some sort of context on that. Obviously, the the parts that kind of really attracted me about Amazon were, was aggregating products. I tried to do the same sort of thing at, at Tesco for a couple of years. That that didn't really work for a couple of reasons. Largely timing, mm-hmm. um, largely because they were um, going through that big kind of accounting scandal at the time, which kind of. Fine stopped or like at least paused a lot of the innovation there and then um, you know I found myself working in a startup which was trying to build this kind of big aggregator of products because you're right it doesn't kind of exist like you you Mm -hmm. think that it exists you think that you can go into Amazon and you it can be an everything store and you can find everything but actually what you see is you know 75 percent above the folder ads yeah right you see amazon owned brand products despite the fact that you're putting a brand in that you want to see or you're seeing a challenger brand or something different someone who's paying adverts and that's exactly how like google works right so you think again you put into i want to buy some red adidas trainers and you put that into google sure you see a lot of links right and you go on to google shopping and you see lots of images of lots of red sneakers mm. But you see an awful lot of duplicates within there. Yeah. And so I think many people kind of recognize that, you know, whilst like 20 years ago, Amazon had this idea of like everything stored with a single detail page and price comparison sites existed where, you know, you'd go into like these Kelku's price runners and try and compare products. Actually, like that doesn't happen. And yeah. what, what you end up doing is having to right-click on lots of links and lots of tabs and lots of images, and you basically open up loads and loads of different web pages across the top of your browser. Yeah, and uh, I'm guilty for that as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and the bit that I find leaves a really bad taste in my mouth is this, there's two reasons, right? One is that the data is generally um, pretty poor. I mean, it's 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 often based around barcode numbers, which are the same numbers under barcodes that you see in grocery stores, which was mm. why they were invented many many years ago so not really fit for e-com where you've got multiple sizes colors brands stars materials everything all kind of bundled in together so they will start yeah. getting used differently so the data is really poor to aggregate that and then there's also the business models behind these big companies and so if you think like almost every penny regardless of what google invest in and regardless of uh, whether they steal or don't steal other people's ideas to go and try and build different business units or technologies yeah. and everything that they do there, or whether they want to build self-driving cars, which may or may not be related to that comment, um, what you find is they still make almost all of their money from advertising. Yeah. And so if they make almost all of their money from advertising, when you do put in, I want to buy a pair of red Adidas trainers, mm-hmm. it's in their interest to have you click on five advertisers. Yeah, of course. And so... You know, when advertisers are getting squeezed now, I think it's pretty poor to try and squeeze more money out of advertisers when there's no need. But that deliberate fragmentation of product search and e-commerce is basically taking the time that you could spend with your friends or your family or reading a book or playing a computer or learning a language or anything, your personal time, and it is taking that, extending that time on their site and turning that into ad revenue for them. Yeah. I'm not really comfortable with that. No, (laughs) when you actually put it into perspective and really look into it deeper, it is actually, you don't really think of it when you're just on Google, just doing a bit of shopping and everything like that, but it is the time-consuming part about it, Mm -hmm. which is their big. And we so we started, so R3, we started with trying to aggregate sneakers. Uh, We recognised, like, a a lot of, well, we understood a lot of people recognise that experience of having to check lots and lots of different sites and finding that, you still, it's really hard to like find the right size for you, right? The fits. Yeah. Um, and, you know, lots of stuff's out of stock and it's really hard to aggregate that. We recognize that. But, you know, it, it kind of fundamentally boils down to like all of shopping, right? Next time you go and buy like a microwave, like just obviously going through this cost of living crisis right now. And then, of course, what happens? Like my dishwasher blew up yesterday. Like, nice. obviously, first world problems, but yeah, like, yeah. you know, like why now? 
And so this process of now how do I find a dishwasher and compare that is really difficult. There's nothing really for it, is there? And there isn't. Yeah. And you think that there kind of should be because, again, like you've got Amazon who've been working on like this universal catalogue for you know like over 20 years and you've got price comparison sites, but no one's heard of them and no one really uses them because if the data's poor and they don't have the technology to aggregate the data, they start to become pointless. And yet we're really used to it in other industries. So, you know, if I said to you, think of a comparison site with an opera singer or with a meerkat, yeah, of course. Like, like everyone knows who who we're talking about. Like, yeah. it's almost a given that when you want to compare, like, when you want to take out a credit card or pet insurance, you you find that like you go to a comparison site. You can name all of the comparison sites; they're famous. Yeah. But when you want to go shopping, you basically are what Amazon wants to show you that's their own brand, mm-hmm. or you know what Google wants to fragment to take your time to navigate. Yeah. You know, and that's a long and that's. And that's, like, before you even think about, like, how do you discover stuff? How do you find new stuff? How are you at the mercy of, like, Facebook ads, Instagram mm. ads? You know, are you scrolling through Pinterest? Are you reading, like, subreddits? That's where a lot of brand loyalty comes in, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Well, I think that we... Is it brand loyalty? It depends with what you want to get, right? Because if you're there, like, oh, I only buy Sony TVs uh, okay. and, and stuff like that, then it's obviously that's where... That's what I'm saying. That's the loyalty comes yes. into it. But even then... Where is it somewhere you can compare all of them? Okay, it's only Sony's website, but then what about the offers on PC World? Or Yeah, I, I guess when, when I hear kind of brand loyalty, I think actually like slightly more overarching than that, I think people are are kind of loyal in like their destination to thinking I'll start with Amazon or Google. Yeah, and that, well, they are as well, and, right? and that loyalty is, is, is tough to hear as loyalty because actually I think it's... I think it's more an acceptance. Yeah. Like we've basically... It's habit as well, isn't it's it? It's habit. We've basically accepted or adapted to the fact that like when you go onto Amazon, you know that you're going to have to scroll through a bunch of stuff that you don't want oh, to see. Oh, yeah, of right? like, And then you probably kind of quietly kind of pat yourself on the back and go, oh, I still managed to find a good deal here. I just get bored of it and I just go, oh, yeah, that will do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and I always right? get the wrong thing as well. And then people really can't bother to do returns. Uh, yeah. Especially like that's three, four it's, pound well, it's, buys. It's functional. It's yeah. functional. It's not fun. And yeah. so, you know, there's definitely, like I have a mindset with e commerce now after kind of the years of, of sort of watching that industry develop you know there's got to be function yeah but you've got to have a little bit of fun right you've got to you've got to save some time and be functional but if it's not time you're saving then it's got to at least be an enjoyable experience and not this laborious experience that we kind of have right now yeah and i think that's kind of what aisle three solves perfectly right for <laughs> shoes trainers that kind of space. Yes. Well, the bit that we wanted to, to challenge ourselves on, and by the way, we didn't necessarily think this was going to work because um, because we didn't see anyone else do this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we looked at kind of how like Amazon and, and Google Shopping aggregates products and then all of the other comparison sites. And over time, that's all been powered by this data that's provided by retailers and it's been powered by these barcode numbers. And so when... Uh, I was made uh, redundant, which is a nice way of saying I got a group WhatsApp message at 7.30 on a Tuesday evening whilst I was working away in Manchester to say, you're not going to get paid this month, business is going under. Yeah. Um, we sort of recognised, well, actually, look, there's an opportunity here from being like in this space to say, look, what happens if we kind of learn from that's not how you do things uh, across all those different sized organisations and try and say, can we aggregate all of those products into a single way with not necessarily disregarding, but without us really trusting the retailer's information and trying to become like the custodian of that data? Yeah. You know, do can we can we take all of those different tabs that you open up and understand on those tabs, like this is the color of the trainer, like uh, this is the brand, like this is whether it's a high, low, mid fit yeah um these are all the sizes that are available and can we aggregate them all together without anyone actually giving us explicitly that information to say that they are linked and that was the part we didn't think that we could do Mm -hmm. but we wanted to at least have a crack at doing that just to understand like is the next 20 years of online shopping going to be exactly the same way as it is now kind of underpinned by this mishmash of data or or is there another way yeah and that was what we that was what we started with R three. I mean, obviously, spoiler alert: like we can do that. Yeah, yeah of course, <laughs> it's what you do now. It's what it's it's what we do now. We have a complete end to end machine learning pipeline which takes and ingests all that information 
and then aggregates all of that information without using the typical um, the typical method of broken product data right now. Fine. Okay, cool. So, and, and also with, with R3, a lot of the people that might be listening might just think, oh, okay, that's if I want to get like Air Forces or something like that. But I've searched for really rare shoes as well and everything comes up. Yeah, so um, ultimately our vision as a business is that we will remove that need for you to open another app or a tab whenever you yeah. shop. So that spans across any product in any category in any country you know I, I would love to have someone spin up a shopify site in another country and we automatically find out that product yeah and we recognize that site we find a product we recognize the product and then we can pull it into our category into our catalog yeah and we can classify that against every other available offer like i would love that to happen and mm-hmm. um, building a business from the circumstances that we started which was taking a twenty five thousand pound personal loan out like literally like a couple of weeks after being made redundant um, and then trying to go through this kind of fundraising journey to build a business and fund a business you know pragmatically we had to recognize look what's a category that we will we want to solve first of all yeah and maybe from the outside looking in, as much as people can kind of understand that shopping journey of looking for sneakers, it seems like or feels like starting with something really visual like sneakers is probably a good place to start. Yeah, especially with testing technology, right, as well. Yeah, except the reason we picked sneakers, one of the reasons was that it's actually one of the harder categories to actually aggregate. Oh, fine. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that stems from the fact that with fashion... Mm-hmm like the barcode numbers product IDs are really not widely adopted, or at least they are uh, in some cases like incorrectly registered to maybe like a style or collection of a shoe and not necessarily all different sizes and colors. So we knew that like there was a big problem there with the data. And because it's fashion, a lot of the e-commerce stores actually take their own images for their sites. Yes, and how some of them betray certain items of clothes doesn't match up. I've got this big thing of t-shirts at the moment. Uh, right, a well, few retailers fa- yes, I mean, fashion is another, is, is the only thing that we could kind of identify as being harder than sneakers. So we yeah, wanted yeah. to set the bar pretty high uh, to try and solve um, that category. And of course, like sneakers, some are pointing left, some are pointing right. Some people put them on boxes. Some people put them on a person. Yeah. Sometimes you just see a bit of the leg sticking out the top, like, you know, we had to kind of not just um, try and find a way to like match up these images from all these, like firstly acquire all these images from all these different sites yeah. and then match them up. But there's a whole process in the middle to say, well, hang on, we need to understand where it's pointing and which part's a person and which part's the shoe. So that's the bit I guess no one thinks about. Uh, yeah, I think, and that's, you know, that's the kind of unspoken reason that we went for a really complex product because we always knew that, you know, our vision wanted to extend beyond sneakers. And so, um, you know, we had to really kind of meet that challenge head on. Now, you have the opposite problem in other categories that we have uh, completed our, our proof of concept on. Um, for example, electronics, like a black TV. Like a TV is just a big black box, right? Yeah, but yeah. it looks the same as, you know, a chopping board, right? Yeah. Like it's, just, like it's the same as a slate chopping yeah, board, break it down. a TV and a laptop and a phone. And, you know, a notebook, right? they're all the same. Yeah, I guess that's when it gets really tricky. But also sneakers, a massive industry, right? It's never something that's yeah. going to die. Mm. Look, people are, are going to want to carry put, carry on putting stuff onto their feet. And, um, you know, like it's, it's maybe an uncomfortable subject at the moment, like with the rising living costs. And, you know, that's, that's not going to get any better anytime soon. But... Yeah. You know, again, like we have that obligation now as a, thinking as an e-commerce business and as a as a retailer really as well. It's really important to put that thing that you want to buy like in front of you quickly yeah. and easily so that you can also get some comfort and trust that you're getting the best price. Yeah, definitely. And that's obviously what you guys solve. But you mentioned funding there as well. And I've got a lot of mates that, you know, have gone through that or are about to go through that. And they always ask me and I'm like, oh, I can't really help you with that. I've never gone through that that process. But what was the process like going, getting funding and sort of managing that after as well? Um, so I, so I, I've never had investment conversations before, I'll tell yeah. you. Um, and we knew as a like highly intensive R&D business that although there are lots of really good government grants and, you know, we ourselves, we get about one pound in nine back from the government in R&D credits. Fine. 
Um, you know, you have to kind of front load a lot of the costs of the business. Yeah, of course. So that you can scale that business. And also as well, to to build a scalable business, as founders, you need to be in the business full time. Of course. And of course, being in the business full time is like founding the business at 40 with a family and with a mortgage yeah. going into a pandemic. You know, you have to like front load a lot of the costs of the business so that you really can do that thing that... You know, most many startups say they're startups. They're not startups. Like they're good businesses or, or bad businesses, but they're they're just businesses. Like yeah. a startup is to try and build something quickly and prove if it will work or not. That's what we wanted to do with our data. So you have to front load that cost. Yeah. Um, as a from day one, we have always taken the view of thinking um, thinking very long term in terms of how we've like structured the organization. Yeah. Uh, structured on and prepared all of our legal docs, for example, and then formalized lots of the parts of the business. Because uh, maybe maybe being that little bit older, starting the business, we wanted to really build a solid foundation for a company before we started to go out and talk to investors. Yeah. We get ripped to shreds, right, if not? Uh, yeah, and I mean, look, believe me, I, I got ripped to shreds on many of our uh, early investment calls. I think back on some of them, they were just frankly horrific, you know. Yeah. Um, because of our background and you know what we're trying to solve and how big that could be, you know that certainly l- lends itself well to a lot of like inbound conversations. But of course, if you're not ready for those conversations at the phase of the business, then um, you know I, I, I answered a lot of stuff terribly. I'm sure I did, yeah. and and also a lot of people talked to us way before they should have even been speaking with us, or they were more generalists and they weren't the kind of experts that could have helped. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, you know, th- there's so many things that, that we would probably have done differently throughout that journey. But what we have always done is set up like a strong legal process and structure and operational support for the business. Yeah. And looking back now, is that when you say there's a few things you do differently, is there anything like in particular that you think that if you could give a bit of advice to someone that's about to go through that process? Um, I think look, I caveat this heavily with like, what is the business trying to achieve? What category you're in? We've built a business that really even now after like two years, like the bulk of the, like all the R and D's been completed, but it's still very like it's green shoots in terms of like the business metrics, the commercial yeah. part of the business. So that means that we've been in a really unenviable position for two and a bit years of getting investment and raising and building and hiring a team for a pre revenue business that for a large part, that was also pre-product, by the way. Yeah. And that's really, really challenging, especially when you think about a lot of the... And I'd encourage anyone who's, who's thinking about um, going through a funding journey, like look at some of the stuff that you see on LinkedIn and social and then try and like process that and think about what's the real hidden story behind that because it's very easy to look at social and see lots of big funding rounds yeah. and lots of businesses and VCs apparently splashing cash everywhere or big like a X Factor style pitching days where yeah. everyone turns up and like... Dragon's Den style. Yeah, but you know, like almost none of those businesses, in fact, like I, I was going to say almost none of those businesses get investment from those events. I've never met a business ever that's gone through like a pitching event and put themselves out there that's like walked off and then met someone who's then gone and given them a check. Yeah. Right? probably the process of pitching has helped them for further down the line, of course. but not for that particular event. Good practice. It's good practice, but it's practice in the public eye. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that one of the lessons I had was that, you know, fundraising is basically a full-time role. Okay. And so as like a CEO of the business, like I'm the one out almost continually trying to fundraise, but how do you then go and build a business off the back of that if you can't spend any time actually working within the business? And so I was in an enviable position of having a really talented co-founder who's concentrates on the products, very different to me, like personality wise, you know, I kind of joke, there's like kind of the extrovert and the introvert behind us. Yeah. And most people probably can't even find uh, my co-founder's name or find him on the internet. Yeah, no, I couldn't find him, but I knew you had one. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so that dynamic worked really well for us, but there are definitely moments where I've thought, in hindsight, could I have maybe stepped back a little bit from funding and actually worked in other parts of the business to kind of move that forward or maybe at least had a little bit more kind of like time for my own kind of mental well-being really yeah. because 
working back in the business when you're already doing a full time job also took up an awful lot of my days and yeah, my weekends. Course. Yeah. And so I think if people are thinking about starting a business, firstly decide do you need funding? Mm hmm. And then if you do need funding, does it need to be VC funding? Like there's a very specific like two and 20 model with VCs. Like they expect that like almost all of their portfolios die or at least they should do, by the way. I'm not convinced that that's happening qu quite now. Like most money's being deployed into like already profitable businesses or previously exited founders. That's that's not really VC. It'll change again, I'm sure, and go back yeah. to being more venture capital. But also a lot of businesses aren't, going to be a billion dollar business and that's also fine by the way yeah i think everyone expects <laughs> it to fine. be don't they yeah yeah and really? that's a bit of a challenge for me about the hustle porn stuff being an entrepreneur like everyone's expecting you to set a business up become millions and millions and millions exit and then do it again and that's become this thing where it's like people expect that to happen all the time yeah i think so like if i look at like our business journey and then some of the some of the bullshit that you see elsewhere yeah there is a really specific moment in time as to why we can build r3 yeah like, you, if if a price comparison site even ten years ago would have tried to do what we do with how we manage, manipulate, standardize, and classify data and aggregate that, like it, it would have taken skyscrapers full of servers to yeah. have processed that information, and it would have cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars, like a month. Right, that's just what it would have cost, and and like now it's like thirteen bucks. Yeah, like, of course. Like so, so we have got like an opportunity now where there are some things that mean that we can do what we want to do now, which couldn't have happened. We we have a really smart way of like um, creating a checkout. So even if you want to buy, let's say, five different pairs of sneakers from five different retailers, you can do that all in one click yeah. on our site. Again, that just wasn't possible um, even just a couple of years ago. But to counter that, what you do see certainly on social is like now's the time that you can do whatever you want. Like it's free to go and get like this software, this software, this software. So there's no excuse. It doesn't cost you anything. Go and build a pitch deck, build a business. And then yeah. you can get like 30,000 like monthly run rate, like amazing away you go. Like, so it just doesn't happen like that. You don't just like switch stuff on and have it work. And yeah, of course. And I go, I go back to like some of those stories of, of like, really big entrepreneurs that we kind of think and hold like uh, almost like in godlike status that i'm sure jeff bezos did drive across the country to uh, a state that was more favorable for taxes and i'm sure he knew that because he was a hedge fund manager and you know he was and, and i'm sure he was smart as a kid and i'm sure the stories about him like taking his cot apart and then putting it back together and making a yeah. radio and stuff when he was like four years old. Like, oh, I'm sure that happened. <laughs> and I'm sure he wrote like the business model and the Amazon flywheel on a, on a napkin. Yeah, that's great. But he also had a nice chunk of change from his parents to start the business off. Yeah. That a lot of people don't have. And they don't have either that money or those connections to go and start that. So if you think that because... Jeff Bezos used to pack boxes on a door, a, like a desk made of a door. And because that can happen, like you can definitely do it. Yeah. Like, no, like news for you, like 96% of investors you speak to are going to say no. Like 0.03% of businesses ever raise venture capital money. Uh, something like 80% like of businesses are bust after the first year they're done. And like over 90% are done within three years. Yeah. Like, like that's the reality of it. And so we had this natural bias on social media to like celebrate all these successes. But at the same time, you don't really recognize that for every one like Bezos that suddenly like yeah. built a trillion dollar business, there's like 999 other people that, I don't know, like they defaulted on their mortgage. And so then they fell out with a husband or wife and then they lost access to their kids or they killed themselves. Like, I, I'm dark, but like that's yeah, the no, reality it's, of it. It's, it's right? a mad risk. People don't realize the risk behind it. No, like three quarters of founders are known to have like suffer from mental health issues. It's hardly surprising. Yeah. It's stressful. It's stressful for many people in their job, right? When you think about your targets and you think about sometimes the relentlessness of what you do in your own life or your business. Yeah. But to then kind of like pile onto that, like someone's given you money to go and do something. And by the way, whatever you said you were going to do when someone gave you that money is probably going to be a bit different because it's not that kind of smooth, kind of like plain sailing. There's lots of things that change. And so you're basically kind of, um, uh, and Andreessen, for all that he 
puts all his money into the likes of Adam Newman and stuff like that, which is pretty crooked, um, has comes up with a really good uh, analysis of it that as a founder, like you've, you're trying to work your way through like an ideas maze and then you get to like the dead end and then you go back a bit and then you yeah, try yeah. And so, you know, what you want to try and be is the founder that gets as close to the end or out of the maze as possible and has learned all of those lessons. And that's like the true story. It's not mm. go and spin up, like use the free version of Canva and like, oh, you can use a trial version of Slack to go and talk to your mates and start building a business and yeah, away yeah. you go. Like you're most likely going to fail. That's the reality of it. Mm. That, I think people don't think about that as well. Like we said about risk a minute ago, I don't think people realise the risk that founders have actually on their shoulders. Of like the HMRC is a prime example. When they come knocking, okay, you can have to look at this and everything like that, and the stress and stuff that can cause the hustle porn behind being an entrepreneur really doesn't help that. It it doesn't. I mean, look, there's 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 two extremes that seem to be like manifesting right now. One is this like we're going to kill ourselves, but like you know now's the best time to do it. And then the other one is uh, like the opposite of that, where I get that like we should be caring about our mental health and we should be more open about that. But, um, I, you know, and I speak like this personal experience, right? As a founder, like times are, are tough sometimes. Yeah. Now, I don't feel as a founder, there's ever an acceptable time for me to say to the team or anyone in a business, uh, sorry, like I'm the one that signs off payroll and sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm f- I'm having a mental health day, so yeah, so yeah. so so sorry. You're not getting paid on Friday. I, I need a few days off. I'll sort it when I'm back Monday or Tuesday, and I'll sign it off then. Yeah, because it's just overwhelming for me. Like, like, how does that how does that work? Like, how how can you exist when you can't? Like you. So many times that people will talk about like I'm taking time off. I think you should do this. Like, okay, but. Really, like you've taken like a million pounds of someone's money, investment into your business. Do you do you genuinely talk to investors and say, "Sorry, I'm, I need to take a few days off my mental health. I'm, I'm cancelling the meeting at short notice. I'm not coming. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, just sort it out." There. It doesn't really no. work like that. That's not the real world. So there's somewhere like this balance in between that of like you have to do everything all the time, relentless, and you also have to care about yourself and your team. There's somewhere kind of in the middle where you need to probably like prioritize like productivity and you yeah. know, do I enjoy working with the people I work with do I learn from the people I work with and that's probably a pretty good foundation yeah and that's never the story that gets told no and also if you end up being relentless all the time you're going to end up having to take those breaks you're going to go from one end to the other and you're going to keep going back and forth because you're always taking breaks and you're going to have to be really relentless for a period and burn out and then yeah possibly I, I, again I, I'm as a really transparent founder I I and I speak only from my experience. Like yeah. A lot of people say to me, you're running a startup that like must be fun. Uh, and probably the answer to that is like, it's never fun. Like yeah. For a start, it's never fun, but it's exciting. Yeah. It's also really depressing. Yeah. Uh, it's also like moments of like, I could cry with happiness. And then there's also times where I could probably sit on the sofa and have a little cry and think, yeah, I can't quite work out how I can do this. Yeah. And that's the kind of, un- I think that's the kind of unspoken truth that you have to kind of prepare yourself when you're a founder running a business. You know, like, like almost everyone in our team, like, I, I don't know, I've, I've never met, like, we built the entire business remotely. Yeah. Um, and that was the only way to build a business when you build a business when most of the planet is on lockdown. Yeah. And so there's different ways that you then build up those relationships and you have those exhilarating moments together or that, like, responsibility and that burden but you definitely never just tick along no it's it doesn't get spoken about enough does it it's, it's really tricky but you mentioned there as well building a team worldwide which i'm quite interested about and intrigued by so how, how do you find managing a team that first of all you, you, have you met them yet uh so no no fine no, so you, you almost, never met the team yeah. worldwide how, how do you find managing them on a day to day so uh, I've been really lucky how we've structured the business. That yeah. A lot of what I, um, we probably joke about this analogy, but and, and I'm not this good at football, but we kind of joke a little bit that I'm like the kind of like messy and yeah. like, like my co-founder's like the Iniesta. Fine, <laughs> like, okay. You know, like there's the brains of the organisation kind of pinging the passes around and making stuff happen and tick over. Um, 
and like moving us forward and then there's someone who sticks a ball in the back of the net now obviously Messi slightly more than that probably. yeah of maybe, course maybe, maybe I'm more like a I don't know like a Gary Lineker and just literally standing in the six yard box yeah but Jermaine that's Defoe, yeah, yeah. yeah right <laughs> so so you know I've been quite lucky in that respect that a lot of the burden of like actually doing the day to day like project management team yeah comes from having someone else in the business which I also think is really important for you know anyone else thinking starting a business, starting, running a startup themselves. Like, There's a lot of pros about doing it on your own. You get yeah. to make all the decisions, so you're probably going to be quicker on the decisions. And you know what? If you get those decisions right, you're probably going to go a lot quicker yeah. on your own, probably a lot quicker. But you're more likely to get to destination when you're doing it together with someone else. Yeah. And so that's taken a lot of uh, like the day-to-day responsibility. But yeah, like... I think about how like we set stuff up operationally. We started to hire and in part it was driven by like a use of funds and how much money we had in the business. You know, we we're not one of those like headline stories that you see when a previously exited founder goes back to the same VC and all of yeah. a sudden has 20 million quid to like start on day one pre-product pre-revenue so they go out and hire a bunch of C-suites, like they've got CMO, CTO, they've even got like a chief people officer all on 150 grand a year, bang on day one. And they go, let's go and build a business. Yeah. You know, we've always had to like build the team, try and prove the product. Oh, and also build a website that works. Yeah. That people will put their details into so that orders can actually get shipped. Like that's an awful lot of stuff for a very small team. Yeah. And so we've always found like really efficient ways of working and building a team. So we started to look outside the UK almost like straight away when we, we looked at hiring. And, uh, you know, like the natural places to look would tend to be sort of more towards Eastern Europe where there's yep. lots of um, like software houses, lots of engineers, and also in India, which is, you know, like a rapidly booming economy now. And there's a huge yep. talent pool there with, you know, the big kind of uh, MMCs going in now, like you've got like Amazon and Microsoft and Uber and Delivery, all like building these huge books. And that's before you even think about like Zomato or, you know, like Flipkart, like the big businesses they've built there. So there's an awful lot of talent in India. Um, and so we started looking uh, in India. We found ourselves uh, a, a wonderful developer called Ravi, who was like employee number one uh, into India. And that then led us to start to build like the team around him a little bit a little bit of luck a little bit yeah. of judgment and that's kind of how you start to then build like this cohort of of people that you can trust in the organization yeah hiring internally hiring is the most difficult thing right uh, yeah i mean hiring is really tough when you can yeah. a lot of stuff becomes tough like meeting investors and pitching investors and having them like put six figures into your business when the likelihood is you're never going to meet them. You know, you're not looking in the whites of their eyes and shaking their hand and saying, I'll look after your money and them saying, I'm definitely going to put this money in. Yeah. But you don't see any of that. You have to judge all of that. You have to do that when you're, when you're hiring as well. We took one step further with India to again, like sort of further our commitments when um, we kind of get lost in COVID. Yeah. And you kind of forget that there's like lots of other stuff that happens around the world as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we uh, we had a brand designer uh, working with us who like we didn't hear from for like five days, kind of like disappeared off the planet. And he was kind of caught up with all like the power outages and the riots and the Black Lives Matter protests. Fine, okay. Uh, we had um, a developer in like Belarus where there was an election that was uh, not met with enthusiasm and so right. I think the president uh, like shut off the internet for a week crazy right? stuff that happens, like all it? of that stuff's happening around the world and like in India there were these massive flash floods and and then you've got the and then on top of that you are layering like COVID right so the, the timing of COVID when we kind of recognize like the guys in India guys and girls in India going sort of through the second wave of COVID we wanted to kind of formalize that structure in the business so that they had like a proper company to work for. They weren't kind of freelancing to a UK business. Yeah. And there was a couple of reasons. One, you know, firstly, like people first, we wanted to protect our people, make sure that they were like paying their taxes and all that, that was taken care of and they didn't need to worry about that. Yeah. Um, but it also made sound business sense because a lot of startups outsource a lot of the really key early decisions around like building an app, building a product, building like some of their tech to a software house somewhere else. Yeah. 
and you know you lose like an element of control when it's like a client relationship and so kind of coming around to like your point about like how do you build that team well like the first thing you have to do to build a team is they have to be part of your team yeah they have to be part of your team and formalizing that and having them even move from what was our team but still technically all freelancers into actually being under like i'm personally the director of aisle three india private limited it's Fine. based in gujarat <laughs> like we've got an office yeah. it was actually our first ever permanent office <laughs> before Fine. we had one in the Free uk, the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? you know that level of formality also shows a commitment to that team yeah that's that's mad isn't it that, that your first office was actually in india before you even I know, and you cannot imagine the amount of paperwork for um, like building an Indian company. Oh, and it's, it's crazy. not like company's house where you pay like thirteen quid and like you put your details in, and anyone can you know within CEO. five minutes you're, yeah. you're suddenly yeah suddenly you can put CEO on your LinkedIn status. And I mean, why not go and find someone on Crowdcube and put five pounds into their business? You can also be an angel investor. And and then stick that onto your hustle porn on LinkedIn. I think it's too that. easy actually to set up a company in the UK. Like too easy to call yourself a CEO. But like, I know loads of people that are lash technicians and call themselves CEOs. And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know. Are you? Uh, look, the title's interesting. Don't know. Um, you know, it's like it's very easy to kind of give everyone C-suite titles when you don't have departments underneath them. Yeah, you know, like um, I find it very American as well. I, I I don't say call anyone CEO and stuff like that. I think when you communicate with investors, yeah, um, it's helpful to have at least a recognizable structure. Yeah, and also when you talk to other like partners or commercial partners, again, you need to have some kind of visual hierarchy because most of the process when you're externally explaining your business or trying to cut commercial deals or talking to investors is about yeah. trying to give people as much comfort and familiarity as they can have. Of course. And so, yeah, even thinking about like just being a founder of a business, you're kind of like the CEO. So you have to, that's who an investor yeah, expects to speak to. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes there's a time where you're cutting a commercial deal and actually you probably want to have, and I, I, I really, I have like, I'm really, feel uncomfortable with a lot of the ego stuff around it i, I hate a lot yeah, of that yeah, stuff of course but sometimes you do have a should we say a ceo to ceo conversation sometimes yeah. that makes stuff happen no of course i, I hate i hate this I, I, hate, I, I genuinely like hate a lot of that stuff but you're quite right like stuff is easy it's very easy to say you're a ceo say that you're an angel investor and yeah. gosh you know like <clears throat> again a tip for anyone that's raising money like, <clears throat> firstly, make sure the people that you're talking to, like, do they have any money? Like, it's very easy to, you can invest into, by the end of today, what, in the next hour, you and I could probably invest in 20 businesses on something like Crowdcube or Seed. Oh, yeah, of course. And it would be a fiver each. And there you go, for £100 each, we've suddenly become, like, two of the most prolific angel investors over the last... Oh, yeah. Uh, like, over 2022. Right, on LinkedIn, you can say, oh, I've invested in this, 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 mm -hmm. this. And the amount of people that then message you saying, oh, like, I need investment. <clears throat> and you can mm -hmm. let them build massive pitches for it and you could actually mm -hmm. have a tenner in the bank. Yeah, and look, I, I've had it happen in uh, every one of our investment rounds. Bizarrely, in the, the last one, I go back to my point about not meeting someone, I genuinely did look someone in the eyes, shake their hand, and they said, oh, I'm 100% in, the money's in. And were they in? Like, bollocks. They didn't even have the money. Yeah. Like, they're, they're like they'll get found out one day. Um, but, you know, in every... It's a waste of time. Waste of their own time. It's such a waste of energy. And so in every single round, we had uh, someone who, like, bailed at the last minute because they weren't who they kind of said they were. You and can't really call it out and try to say, you need to prove to me that you can do this at the start. Well, and then can you... Uh, look. I have. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that there's plenty of people that maybe don't like some parts of how I communicate because they might say I'm a little bit direct or a little bit pushy. Generally, people are happy asking a direct functional... Like they're, they're, they're fine answering a direct functional question if you know the answer to it. You're not hiding anything. If you're not hiding anything. Yeah. And and I've always been, you know, incredibly transparent as a CEO. One of my one of my biggest weaknesses, I have a terrible memory. I'm yeah. really good with names and faces. 
Um, I'm really good at like networking and remembering people that I see. But when it comes to like <laughs> a lot of like events and things, like yeah. there's a lot of stuff I forget. So I kind of had this little motto, which it's fine, by the way, not having a good memory, as long as you don't lie. Yeah. And so if you genuinely always act with integrity, with the best intentions, and you tell the truth, even if that truth is slightly different in the moment that you're telling it, like, it's the truth. You actually don't really need to remember a lot of stuff. Yeah, of course. And so... I'll be honest, say you forgot. Right. Yeah. And so that's really interesting that when you start having these kind of conversations that sometimes are quite um, power-led or, like, position-led, yeah. actually... You know, when, especially let's say you're talking to an investor, you should be quite open. You should be open about like what you're, you're going to use the money for. You should also be open about saying, well, actually, I don't quite know about this. I've got some conviction that there's one or two things that we're going to do here. And this is why. And you start just have this really transparent. And because you, because it's in your head and you're being honest about it all, it, it doesn't change. Yeah. And you become more likable as well. Yeah. And you don't, you know, you've not got a story to either remember or change. And that works the other way as well. And so, yeah, at times I, I've definitely got better at trying to work that out. Like a little tip for anyone trying to raise money, talking to an investor for the first time. I will try and start every call with an investor now, very simply along the lines of, I know that you're super busy. You probably have hundreds of founders contact you all the time. So you can't possibly speak to them all. You've spoke to me today. Like, what is it that excites you about our business? Yeah. You know, what are you hoping to find out? And, and that pretty much frames your conversation straight away because when I go back and look at the disasters that I had, it was people that were looking at deal flow or were unengaged or weren't really interested or were like ticking a box and it yeah, was yeah. just a job. You know, and if you hear someone say, oh, well, you know, nothing really that exciting. Like, I don't really know too much about it. Like, someone just whizzed the deck. I didn't really look at it. Just go and tell me what you do. Like, do you know what? Actually, like, I don't know. Like, I think life's too short. Yeah, like, yeah, I think life's too short. Like, going back to, like, the stresses and strains and the mental health issues, you need to surround yourself with as many people who are excited about you, what you're doing, what the vision could be, and want to have, like, a genuine two-way, like, working dialogue. And yeah. find that out early. See, that's quite interesting. So I think that might play into your spike. The stuff that you've mentioned recently in the last like 10 minutes, I think there's a few of them that I think like that could actually be your spike, which leads quite nicely on to what, I th well, what it is. So obviously your spikes are the thing that's unique to you, that trait, or it could be anything that's helped you stand out and get to where you are in your career now. What, what do you think your spike is? Well, I, I think it's that hustle. I think it's that hustle and it's that yeah. directness. And, um, and sometimes it's polarizing, although by and large, like, that's fine. I'd rather people kind of hate me for, you know, what I am than love me for, for someone I'm not. Yeah. Um, and that really, that goes, that leads then through to like building a business, building a team, talking to investors, even just your personal, personal relationships with your friends and your family. You know, if you, if you're asked to do something, do it. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Yeah. If you're going to respond to someone, do it. Like, don't exist in this kind of ecosystem of, like lies or ambiguity or like ghosting people and all oh, those horrible things. Yeah. Like if you think of all of the horrible things that a lot of the communication technology and social media has kind of given us that we didn't have, again, like, I'm going to sound super old, but like before we had mobile phones, right? Yeah. If you said that you were going to meet someone, you went there and you met them. Yeah. And you know what? We all had that mate that's half an hour late. And so you got there half an hour late. What you didn't ever get is a message like five minutes before you're supposed to meet, half an hour late, by the way, saying, oh, I'm still running late or I'm not feeling well or I'm not coming in. Yeah. And so for me, like I've almost had it kind of ingrained into me that you have to absolutely do and deliver on what you say you're going to do. Like you just have, and if you get stuff wrong, it's fine. Yeah, yeah of course. You know, yeah. I, I'm 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 also the guy that's maybe walks the floor at all of the events. I'm the guy that when you're asked to do a podcast, I go absolutely, and I'll okay. Where is it? <laughs> that's unusual. I've got to go and drive to yeah, go yeah. to it. That's thing about working with people that are direct. I think are the easy people to work with as well, because you just take it face value, and and yeah. it's just it's to the point. Like especially our clients, we want deal ones that aren't direct about things. You know, when it comes to feedback. 
they're sort of treading around it. It's like, just be direct. Is it a yes? Is it no? That's, that's what that person wants to know. Okay, why? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. That's it. And that doesn't need to be aggressive. Yeah, all, you, yeah. And, and, but you do have to sometimes, like, soften the edges or you do have to work on, like, the rules of engagement Yeah. so that, like, people understand that you're not being direct. But, you know, I, I, I really kind of, like, makes my skin crawl almost, like, when you get this email from, like, someone you've not even, like, heard of and they're, like... Oh, like you know I hope you're doing really well like how are you today and the bit that really makes me mad about that is I have this little hack that I'd encourage everyone to try and do yeah I, on LinkedIn um I put my middle initial with a full stop in my first name yeah because yeah, yeah. no human ever sends me a LinkedIn message or scrapes my LinkedIn profile and then sends me an email that says hello Thomas capital J full stop comma right No one does. No one ever sees that, right? So I now know that almost 90% of my communication can get disregarded. Yeah. All of the inbound stuff. And when you see that kind of level of insincerity that, like, it's clearly an automated message. Yeah, yeah. Like, hello, Thomas, capital J, full stop, comma. How are you doing today? I see that you're the CEO and co-founder of, you're like, oh, give me a break. Yeah, yeah. Mine's got my mine's got my really long ones like founder slash co-founder entrepreneur. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, Like that's what like they take your LinkedIn headline. So I think there's so much value. And then when I think about like how we tie that then back to our business, again, like it drives me insane that two billionaires can put themselves into space. Yeah, and we can come up with a vaccine for a virus that people didn't even know existed a few years ago. Yeah, and yet if you want to buy something online. Like your time, your precious time that you can spend doing something fun or spending it with people you love is being turned into money for a big tech business. Like, guys, life's too short. Yeah. Like, can we just get stuff done? Can we just be a little bit more direct? Can we be a little bit more functional? And then that's a much easier, much more transparent way to, to live our lives. No, I completely agree. And um, last question, just to round things up. Dinner guests, right? Dinner party, okay. your house. Three people, dead or alive, you're cooking for them as well. Who who are you uh, picking? Uh, can I have four? Okay, go for it. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd take four. I would sound really old and sentimental. I'm 43 now. I lost my dad when I was 20. Um, so I would probably bring him back yep. and sit around the table with my wife and two kids. Nice. I like that. That's cool. a good one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you can get better than that. I feel a bit emotional now, so carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what, though? I, I, I do think that like, when I spoke to Joe... His was his dad as well, 100%. He's someone want to spend more time with him. Everyone always goes for, you know, even I do it, to be honest. So, like, you know, really famous people, you know, Winston Churchill and people like that. There's not many people that actually think a bit deeper into that from more of a sentimental one. So I really like that. That was really nice. Thank you. Um, really enjoyed having you on. Really good catching up. We haven't yeah. seen each other in a while. Yeah, um, it was great to see you again, mate. It was really yeah. good. No. Cheers, man.